Welcome to the Recycle Podcast, where we discuss everyday issues from a mental health perspective. We are your hosts, Dr. LaFanya Jones, Dr. Rashonda Strickland, and Dr. Nichelle Wall. Now don't get it twisted. We're not going to be your stereotypical therapist. What we will be is down to earth, informative, a little spicy, and vulnerable. All right, interns, turn up the volume, grab your pen and paper. It's supervision time. As a reminder, this podcast is not meant to take the place of a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Welcome back to session 34, Beyond Shattered Glass. Okay, interns. This week's session is about vulnerability. And I know you're probably wondering what vulnerability is. So I'm going to give you two definitions. (laughs) So the first definition, vulnerability is the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. And the second definition is vulnerability is an act of courage because you merge with your authentic self instead of hiding behind a facade to appease others. Come on, authentic self. Authenticity. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Makes me think of that uh, hierarchy of needs. I was thinking that (laughs) too, (laughs) self-actualization. Yes. Look at y'all thinking of Maslow, bringing him on in. Mm -hmm. Come on, Abraham. (laughs) (laughs) Because y'all know I'm I'm about to get into my Psych 101 lesson for the day. Yes, go ahead. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a pyramid based and your foundation is made up of your physical needs. So that's food, shelter, water, things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then you have your next level, which is safety and security. So that's things like, you know, now that I've got food, shelter and water, is all of this stuff secure? Am I in a neighborhood that I feel like I'm you know, okay, Ian, do I have enough financial um, security to, you know, sustain myself, things like that. Your third level will be love and belonging. So this is friendships, relationships, being able to, you know, just be with people. Mm -hmm. Then you've got uh, self-esteem, right? Esteem needs, Mm -hmm. yeah. Esteem needs. So that's you, you know, do you have self-love? And then at the tippy, tippy top, is Mm self-actualization and this is like the culmination of all of those things like have you become a fully self-aware person Mm -hmm. and reached your level of enlightenment this is where you are fully fulfilled yes and it's actually difficult for people to reach that level it is I will honestly say I think people struggle with the third level on up the belonging Uh and and I think we've talked about this briefly in other sessions. This is why people can't get to that level of success. They truly desire Mm -hmm. because they don't feel like they belong. And we, that's when the imposter syndrome comes in and everything else. And I think people, if they were really truly getting this information from elementary on up, it would be so much easier for us to have well-rounded individuals. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think we don't teach children how to, how to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I think, That's and and I don't want to necessarily put that on teachers because they have enough to do. But I I think it's lacking in all areas. Mm -hmm. You -hmm. know, the school counselors have. I remember when I was in school, we had one school counselor and one guidance counselor for a whole high school. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. my high school was not small. So I'm (laughs) like, yeah, how are you going to be counseling everybody? Mm -hmm. You know, and just think about the I don't know if. I think schools now have multiple counselors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think they need to provide opportunities to teach about vulnerability because it's, it's difficult to be vulnerable if you're terrified. Mm -hmm. Um, And because you're scared that people going to, people going to see you right. And what they're going to think. Yeah. I was just, you know, to piggyback off what you're saying, I was thinking we got to first change our connotation of what vulnerability is Mm -hmm. because most people hear that word. And the first thing that they think is, well, I'm not weak or soft. I can't tell you how many, because we do see this clientele a lot 
a lot. I can't tell y'all how many black men I've had come sit on the couch and be like, I'm not supposed to be out here looking all soft, looking all weak. And I'm like, what are you really talking about? I said, so we just going to perpetuate misogyny. That's what we going to do today. Mm-hmm. I usually <laughs> tell my clients, I think that it's, more it takes more courage to be vulnerable than it does to cry to to be stoic and just not having any type of emotion robot versus well-adjusted human Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes i'll go with that well-adjusted human for 400 alex (laughs) (laughs) r.i.p (laughs) r.i.p yes (laughs) because he was a savage he was real (laughs) Uh, man uh, but I totally agree with you ladies that, you know, that idea, and I, I wonder where that came from, you know, originally the idea that being open, being honest, being in tuned with where you are emotionally, you know, just not even for black people, just like in general, in general, where this idea, and I don't know if that's an American thing. I think or it's that's more a, American, but I've seen it also in um, my Asian Arab culture. community mm. as and well I've seen as it Asian, Asian uh, community okay. as well. But I think in other cultures, it shows up differently because I could even say I've seen it in Hispanic cultures with the machismo mm-hmm. and all of that. Yeah. So I think it just kind of depends, but I guess it, it comes from, you know, people who have settled or colonized you know countries and things like well land at the time it just kind of has trickled down and then it's been morphed into whatever the culture is for mm-hmm. that group of people you but know? you know I, I i i agree with you dr wallace mm-hmm. what, what you just said but i just to add to that i would also say that it comes from betrayal when people mm-hmm. when we I can start see that. feeling pain or betrayal we mm-hmm. start we build that wall yeah because mm-hmm. we don't want people to get close to us and how we learn how to build a wall, I don't know. I don't know if it's learned or if we learn it from ourselves. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to let people in anymore yeah. because yeah. it hurts too bad. There's a lack of accountability when it comes to situations like that. It's like, oh, you hurt me, so I'm not going to ever let nobody hurt me again. Instead of it being like, let me not own the pain that you put on me. Let me yes. give that back to you and hold you accountable for that and then let me heal. We have it mixed up. I get the need to protect ourselves but that's not really where we need to be going with it mm-hmm. and what she because i t- i have had to tell so many of my clients that thing about giving that back to that person mm-hmm. yes and if you're wondering what that is giving it giving something back to a person that does not belong to you it's you allowing yourself to be responsible for your part in whatever situation it is but don't take on the responsibility of the hurt that they gave to you it's almost like um what is the movie with um Vivica Fox and Morris Chestnut two can play that two can game. play that game when they did the gravity the law of gravity Mm-hmm. And he said that he, at first he, uh, Morris Chestnut was at the house and he was all weepy and, you know, crying and upset. And then he went to Vivica Fox's house and transferred that. Uh, Transference of energy. Yeah, there, mm-hmm. it, there you go. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so then she was at the house feeling crying you know crying <laughs> and, we, you know, and so he had it was like he felt so light. Yeah. And so skipping. Mm-hmm, yeah. So that's what it what that means when when we say give it back to that person. Now you ain't got to play the games. Don't no. do that part because no, no, no. that movie is not a great example of how to do things healthily. But <laughs> you do put other people's stuff back on them. I think a few months, it might have even been a year ago by now, but Will Smith came out with a little clip or whatever about the difference between fault and responsibility. And there is a lack of understanding whose fault something is, but also accepting the responsibility of okay, this is how I contributed to something or this is how I need to heal myself and cut this person off or what, you know, whatever the circumstances are. Well, you know, we've talked about this in other sessions because it's much easier to externalize. We do both. We Mm -hmm. externalize situations and internalize. We externalize kind of the the reason, Mm -hmm. but we internalize the result. Yeah. You know, so what ended up happening, so what I mean by that is like what ended up happening, we somehow say that that was our fault. But the reason why somebody did it is because they're, you know, mm-hmm. they're uh, uh, donkeys behind. <laughs> but you know what? That realization don't com- does not come immediately. 
because when you think about people who in terminate relationships, the, I don't know if, if both people, I would, I guess say both people end up taking on the responsibility. It was my fault. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have started this argument. I shouldn't have gone out to the club. I shouldn't have, Mm -hmm. you know, went to work that day. I shouldn't have went out of town with my, you know, it's so many, or, you know, my, my insecurities was, was, yeah ruin the relationship you know yeah. we internalize and we internalize all of that mm-hmm. and then once you get to some point in the separation then I believe like what you were saying we start externalizing mm-hmm. yeah you know we're really good at avoiding yeah. you, you know as a as a species we it's something weird about us and when it comes to opening up to another person we're very um polar you know on the in- ends of the spectrum you're either super stoic and you don't let people in or you're like you open the floodgates and you overwhelm everybody around you you're doing the most <laughs> yeah yeah but we avoid like being able to do it in a taking the time to sit and really think about what is it that I'm really feeling? What is it I'm really experiencing? How am mm-hmm. I thinking about this? What do I believe about this situation? Is this really my situation? Mm-hmm. You know, my junk that I need to take on, you know, all the things you ladies said, you know, we're just at the average person just really has not developed those skills. Yeah. And I, you know, I think a part of that is because we don't know how to connect with people. Being vulnerable allows you to connect with people. Mm-hmm. Boy, that fear that come up from that mm-hmm. or the fear of trying to hold on either side of it. It's just, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think what we fail to realize is that when we connect with people, it gives our lives a purpose. Yeah, it does. And it's not truly something that is scary. We have built it up to be something that is scary because it feels like letting go of something. But the reality is when you're letting go of something, it's only you letting go of really your ego. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not anything else. Like you're not giving that person something you, when you truly are vulnerable and you are in love and I don't mean just romantic love. And y'all know if y'all listen to the sessions, we've talked about different types of love, but it's freedom. Mm Mm-hmm. When, yeah. when you truly love somebody, it is freedom in the relationship and you learn how to exist together. When you have yourself, when you see yourself being controlling or needing to justify why this needs to be like this, the vulnerability is leaving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. And I will not be controlled. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when your ego starts increasing. <laughs> that's hilarious when you said that the first thing that made me think about even though it's not uh, applicable but it made me think about uh denzel washington and training dame when he said king kong (laughs) (laughs) on me yeah because that's how people really be thinking like it's just it's too much like as the only single person in this room right now um it you see it a lot in the dating scene you really yeah. do and it's just like dude or chick whoever you know i'm not supposed to be fighting mm-hmm. you for this either you gonna show up and be present or you're not like if you them issues you're gonna have to go get you a therapist for that and not me mm-hmm. i'm right yeah. <laughs> no dual relationships right here. <laughs> yeah <laughs> But it, you see it in um, partnered relationships as well, you yeah. know, long term. And this doesn't necessarily mean married, but just long term mm-hmm. committed relationships. You see it, too. And I think you start to see it more the longer that you're with somebody, you mm-hmm. know, where you tr- genuinely do lack in connecting with another person yeah. because, you know, as we all know, you never truly know someone you know, inside and out, no. you know, if we even know ourselves in inside and out, but you know, you can over time really start to see where you have, you may have, you know, not let this person in on a certain part of you mm-hmm. because you wanted to protect them from that part of you, or you wanted to protect yourself from, you know, any potential backlash or whatever you you believe or you've made it up in your head to be Mm -hmm. you know I think that that happens consistently in any type of relationship I agree with that yeah 
No, I, I think in order for us to have those true relationships, like Dr. Strickland was saying, you don't truly know someone inside and out. But in order for us to have true relationships, we have to be willing to be vulnerable mm-hmm. because that's how you learn how to trust one another. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, something that I kind of think about is like, I don't want to have to wear a guard up against anybody that's tiresome friends business partners um my mama them (laughs) (laughs) whatever like I want to be able to just be me and there's I can honestly say there is not a lot of people who know me who have seen the real me because they're not trustworthy Mm -hmm. it's easier to be vulnerable with strangers than it is the the people around you in your everyday life yeah Mm -hmm. Well, there's this level of expectation that comes with the people in your life. Mm -hmm. And they know the things that you've done that you probably hold guilt and shame for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. You know, there's not, you know, like I was just saying, there's not expectation with strangers. Mm -hmm. So I don't anticipate you having any type of effect on my life in any real genuine kind of way. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a reason to hide anything or change parts of me because you have no no ground no standing in my life mm-hmm. don't owe them nothing mm-hmm. right see I think with family and friends that know you they ha- I guess I would say they have proven to at, at times to not accept your imperfections and that's why we put up the wall mm-hmm. and then so then we meet a stranger and we can like you, Dr. Wall was mm-hmm. saying, we can allow those imperfection, imperfections to be out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, go yeah. ahead. I was just going to say, that's why you, you always hear in family systems that the older people in the family be acting a fool. Now they don't really be acting a fool. They just don't care no more. They like, mm-hmm. I done got to this age and I'm going to be me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know what? That is so true because I, I, I say all the time, you know, older people don't say, don't care what they say. They don't. Mm-mm. They will. T- uh uh-uh, uh, baby, your hair does not look cute today. It don't. Go comb it again. <laughs> you be standing there like, <laughs> really? My face just fell off my face. My, <laughs> my grandfather used to say, in his words of saying, I don't care, he's like, you scratch your A and get glad. I don't care. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Papa, what is you talking about? <laughs> yes, that is hilarious. Yeah, they just. They yeah. have accepted their imperfections. And if you don't accept them, then mm-hmm. you just need to scratch your A and go on about your yeah. business. I wish <laughs> we so could funny. like do that at a, a younger age. Like that is something that I really want to teach my children when they yes. get here, you know, in a couple of years um, that they just need to be themselves and whoever is for you will surround you. And I think if we had learned that at a younger age, we wouldn't have so many fake friends or imposters in our life that really shouldn't be there. We would be attracting the people that match up with who we are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a part of that is also the seeds that's planted in us. So say for instance, if uh, I'm just going to use Dr. Strickland as an example, because she's kind of talked about this a little bit um, on the sessions before um, with her grades, like making straight A's. Mm -hmm. And just say one time she made a B and it wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, that seed was planted that I have to be perfect in order to be accepted. Yeah. You know, and that is what perpetuates that Mm -hmm. idea of I can't accept my my imperfections. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. Pavlov's dogs. Mm. It's It's a learning theory. Mm hmm. Do we need another psych one-on-one lesson? Go, Go do ahead. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that one is very extensive. So I'm definitely not going to jump into all that. <laughs> uh, but for your mini psych one-on-one lesson, um, for those that aren't familiar with what Dr. Wall is referencing in Pavlov's Dogs, it's something called classical conditioning. And basically you have a stimulus and a response. And then you, over time, between pairing um these this stimulus again i'm now for the real psych people out there i am severely paraphrasing this so don't come in the comments trying to get on me about not explaining classical conditioning thoroughly but basically you pair a stimulus with um 
you know, so that you can elicit a response. And over time, as you remove that stimulus, that response, um, you know, kind of happens automatically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so end of cycle one on one and lesson. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you have to be willing to let go of the person you think you should be to be accepted to others. And you we're not saying that being vulnerable is comfortable. No, oh, not no. at all. Not at first anyway. Mm-mm. Not at all. You know, another thing that I was thinking about, you know, as we were talking about vulnerability and just kind of that whole concept is how we are, we tend to think about ourselves very concretely. You know, I am this, I am that, you know, we have these very roles. Yeah. We have these very strict definitions about who we are and how we move in the world, but we tend to allow other people to be abstract. And we think about them as much more whole beings and complex and, you know, well, they may have, or this situation may have influenced and we don't allot ourselves that same, um, grace. Thank you. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. a good word for it. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I have a question for you ladies, though. Yes, ma'am. Right. It's a vulnerability question. Uh-oh. <laughs> have you ladies ever said, I love you first? Like to a man? Or to, I mean, to a partner or? Anybody. Yeah. Let's just say a partner. Yeah. Uh, but I, let me say this. <laughs> I know. I'm like, let me clarify. I'm trying to think. So, Cause in all honesty, I'm like, we do have clients that listen to this. So I don't know how deep into that answer. I want to go. Don't go deep. You don't okay. gotta go, go deep. deep. I will say I have, but I realized that with this particular person, I probably did because he was submissive. Mm. Mm. So you did it knowing that you would get the same response in return. Yes. And he was a safe place. Mm, mm-hmm. I was in control of the relationship and not like people who don't understand submission mm-hmm. and dominance. Don't, don't come for me. I'm not <laughs> in the mood today, but that's why. Gotcha. Uh, so I will say that I didn't say it first, but I solicited it mm. from that person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Manipulation. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said I don't know how deep that's into okay. that. That's okay. We just leave it at that. We just leave it at that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but I mean, it's definitely a vulnerable thing uh-huh. to do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, so with that said, though, that you can use your vulnerability as a tactic, yeah, mm-hmm. a weapon mm-hmm. of mass destruction. Yes. So it's interesting that both of you ladies said that you did it because you knew you would get, you knew the response that you would get back. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you've never done it, not knowing what you, what response you would get. No, no. So what I will say is a lot of times in my romantic relationships, it ends up happening at the same time. It ends up happening in the course of like a conversation. So, um, it's, it hasn't ever been this, Oh, like I'm holding out, but it typically happens when we're having a conversation versus that one. It was just randomly out of the blue. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, so I would say I have on accident <laughs> because <laughs> I was leaving my apartment to go somewhere and I was in a hurry. So I was, the person mm. was there and I was leaving out and I said, okay, I'm gone. I love you. And I closed the door. But then I was like, wait a minute, what? What did I just say? So I went back in. I said, no, I, I was just playing. No. <laughs> What? How you gonna take back your love? <laughs> Every night he I got to fight. <laughs> Shout out to the five heartbeats. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I took it back. And yeah. I now that and that was definitely a situation that I didn't know the what the response would be, but it was also an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have been sitting there like, uh Okay. okay. <laughs> Now I really don't know how to feel. Now I got that Eddie Murphy in Boomerang when he pulled up that <laughs> that blanket up to his. Okay, well, clutching your pearls. Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. I don't know how you. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. So, so vulnerability. What I'm, what we're getting at is that vulnerability is when you can say something like that or share something personal like that with someone and not know the response you'll receive. 
Yeah, it doesn't matter the response. Mm -hmm. I mean, the response does matter, but your ability to communicate what you are feeling or what your desires are, what your thoughts are, that doesn't matter. Now, you still need to do it from a place of love. Don't be out here annihilating people with whatever you're about to say. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you should be able to voice what's within you without needing something else from someone else. Yeah. And the, and just remember, the more vulnerable you are, the more fear, fearful you will be. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because it's a lot to open yourself up to someone else, you know, because you are potentially asking for corrective feedback you are potentially opening up wounds for that other person because mm -hmm. you know we are in an exchange and in that exchange I may trigger something that you've experienced in the mm -hmm. past just because of what I'm you know referencing in the moment so yeah you got to be prepared that you know vulnerability is I feel like the word dangerous is a little strong, but, um, it's, it's, um, thin territory. It's, uh, what is that? Yeah. Not you're definitely it. towing the line. <laughs> yes. When it comes. It is fragile. Thank you, fragile. Dr. Wall. I could not think of that. Got Man, three back. heads are better than one, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> I was like, I don't know the word. I was going to say thin ice, but I was like, eh, <laughs> that wasn't fitting for me. Mm-mm. See, this is why we work so well together. Yes. <laughs> if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are certain tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's A-N-C-H-O-R period F-M. So if you find yourself able to be vulnerable, you will find yourself able to have a good intimacy. And I'm not talking about sexual. So I'm talking about. Although it, it can help. Yes, that, that is true too. Cause you don't <laughs> know how many couples I've had that. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. Had a flashback. That's she said, I ain't ready. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> But you all wouldn't realize how many couples we have mm -hmm. that come in. And usually it's the wife that says, well, I just want more intimacy outside of the bedroom. That yep. is all encompassing. That means the affection. That may, means the communication. That means the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. the, it, it's tons of different types of intimacy. Yes. Yeah. And for, you know, just to reiterate, just based off what Dr. Jones just said, for our men folk, vulnerability doesn't equal crying. Mm. No. You know, it doesn't mean that your partner wants you to sit there and just boo hoo and spill every single detail about your life or what you're going through. You can still have discernment when it comes to vulnerability. Yeah. And I, I'm of the mindset of... If you don't feel that with the person you with, then what you doing? Like, why you pick them? That's true. Yeah. You know, either you got some stuff you need to work on or this is not the person for you and run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because per personal growth comes with vulnerability. Mm -hmm. When you can share those dark places and in a safe place with a safe person, you, you can have some personal growth. Yeah, that can that's a breakthrough for a lot of people, because mm -hmm. sometimes we just don't feel like we have those people in our lives. And when you find a partner, whether it's a intimate partner, a romantic partner or a friendship, you know, those mm -hmm. relationships are supposed to be relationships that we can be vulnerable in. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -mm -mm. Vulnerability is a funny thing. <laughs> Well, I mean, because I was just looking at some of this, the my notes from when I was doing research and one of the things that um, 
I found while I was looking is the concept that, you know, we fight vulnerability uh, because, you know, the reality of it means that we have to address some emotional pain. Mm, and I was just going to go there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Strickland. So, you know, we fight that because we don't want to deal with that emotional pain because, I mean, in reality, who likes pain? Now, I mean, there are. I was going to say now we're going to put a little <laughs> asterisk right there. <laughs> Again, my. Uh, Sadist and masochist. I was going to say my BDSM folks. <laughs> <laughs> don't be in the comments coming from my head. Um, so we got a little disclaimer out. But in a general sense, you know, most people don't want to be in pain, especially emotional pain, Mm -hmm. because it's such an invisible thing. Mm -hmm. The term gut wrenching is real. Like Mm -hmm. that's like when you really sit down and become a emotionally intelligent person instead of emotionally constipated, um, you really understand the depth of how your emotions work what they feel like, what they can do to your body. You know, how many people, how many interns have cried so hard and then they have headaches afterward? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a releasing of emotional energy to the point of it affected your physical person. Like emotions are not nothing to play with. You really do got to be on top of your game when you're unpacking them and processing them and, you know, figuring out a healthy response to them. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We've talked about that several times in various Mm -hmm. sessions on, you know, that kind of psychosomatic stuff that your body will it's going to release some way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to deal with your feelings, whether you choose to deal with them or not. They said, oh, you ain't going to do it. I got you. Okay, craziness ensues. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Now you got constipation. Now you got headaches, stomach palpitations, can't sleep, Mm -hmm. your back hurt, your neck hurt, hair falling out. That's a big one. Eye twitching, (laughs) you know, like all of these things, you you look over them, not realizing that this is just a bunch of emotional junk that's just sitting there and your body's trying to let you know, like, I can't hold any more of this Mm -hmm. and you're, you're breaking me down. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a big one, because in order for you to be able to heal from that pain that you're afraid to be vulnerable about, you're going to have to do a self-examination. Hmm. And those self-examinations are so scary because it's like you have now you have to hold yourself accountable. You have to be responsible for you. And rarely are they right the first time because self-assessment is got a lot of bias in it. Mm hmm. I mean, self is in the title. Mm-hmm. Self. <laughs> and like we just said, preservation of self is always going to be number one. Even to yourself. Like, mm-hmm. How you lying to you? You, yeah. you. Come on now. Yeah. Didn't we just talk about self-sabotage? Yes. We did. We did. So go back and listen to okay, that one as cause, well. Because they go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Lying to yourself. That's self-deception. Mm. And so a part of how you can do that self-examination is to understand why you react to certain triggers like yeah. why do certain things trigger you mm-hmm. yes we're so afraid to ask ourselves questions <laughs> you know sometimes I, when I'm in session you know I can and I'm talking with cli- uh, clients like about Socratic questioning uh and I what can what is that Dr. Strickland oh we doing multiple psych 101 <laughs> lessons today oh y'all know I'm in my bag today boy <laughs> um so Socratic questioning is basically you just asking yourselves us uh, yourselves yourself a, a series of questions that go deeper and deeper and deeper with the intent to come to some conclusion at the end on where your belief system or that personal narrative comes from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can talk about personal narratives if you guys are interested in in more in depth, but I'll just give you some real quick ones. For example, a personal narrative could be um, at the end of the day, I always believe I'm a failure or I have a self uh, sense of self inadequacy, or I believe I'm unlovable, or I'm unworthy uh, of people's time and energy. So the point of that, that series of questions is trying to get to like, what's the root cause? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes when I'm doing that with clients or I'm trying to talk to them about, you know, Socratic questioning, they really have a hard time with figuring out like, well, I don't know what types of things to ask myself mm-hmm. to really dive deep into where these triggers come from and, you know, how I've developed these thought processes. One of the, I guess, famous <laughs> Socratic questioning that I, I'm assuming we all probably do is asking yourself, okay, if you go to sleep tonight and wake up in the morning, what would be different? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what would be different can be mentally emotionally physically and just in your environment so that's one those are that's one question that you can start off with that's in that way you can kind of ease yourself into it yeah. mm-hmm. instead of jumping both feet in yep. <laughs> yeah <laughs> what i typically ask a lot of my clients and my, my clients don't like this why that why question mess them up every time but because this is it but why okay why that Mm-hmm. okay why this and then to the point where you break it down so much to where you're like none of this even matters I just have been living someone else's narrative for my life and that does not work for me that's why I'm as miserable as I am mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yeah. so you have to start giving yourself um, more attention and appreciation to your complete self mm-hmm. instead of just the side of yourself that brings sorrow yeah mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. multifaceted people. Mm-hmm. Yes. We really are. We yeah. don't allow ourselves to be. Because mm-hmm. no. everybody want to be simple. I'm complex. I'm sorry. But that's just how we are. <laughs> I mean, because all of us have different experiences in life mm-hmm. that make us complex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember somebody that I was working with, and that was one of the big things that we worked on for, I will say definitely at least – maybe three to four months was the complexity of humanness. And we've talked about this briefly, I think on one of the, this broad episodes, but um, that we are not one sided, you know, that you can be, you can manipulate people. You can take advantage of people, but you can also be supportive and you can be encouraging and you can be giving Um, and you can be, um, rude. Like we do all, we all do all of those things at Mm -hmm. some point in time. Yes. And, and, and when she say, all, that's including us as therapists as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are complex individuals. You know, we are, we have emotions you're not void of them. You're not, um, like we've talked before, you're not a robot. So you're going to engage in things that hurt people at some point in time. It's unless you're going to literally go to a desert Island and be by yourself. But even then you're still going to hurt somebody, which would then be you. So it's almost unavoidable to inflict pain on another person. The thing is how consistently are you doing that? And then if you do it, how are you repairing that situation? Are you taking personal responsibility in once you've recognized or you've been informed that you did it? You know, are you denying Mm -hmm. it and just trying to avoid the situation so that you don't have to be vulnerable and say that, man, I really, I messed up here. Mm -hmm. Because taking that responsibility for whatever thing has happened, that is the ultimate vulnerability and you and the reason why I say it's the ultimate is because you have to be aware of your ego like Dr. Wall was saying earlier mm-hmm. because your ego likes to go in to protect you mm-hmm. yeah and you don't need to be protected from everything I'm sorry mm-hmm. sometimes you need to face some things mm-hmm. and heal and grow yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well it's the truth though yeah it is it's like that's why you go to therapy Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because people come to therapy to heal and grow, but then fight the process. Oh, uh, get, mm. You know, we was talking about this right before we came in here. I was like, why are you coming? <laughs> don't come no more. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking in my head. But I don't say that out loud because that's inappropriate. But <laughs> at the end of the day, it's like, okay, do I need to discharge you? So you need to take a break from therapy, really figure out what it is you want, because I'm not in the business of just taking people money for the sake of taking people money. That's not mm-hmm. me. Cause one of the things we do expect is for 
our clients to grow. And one of the telltale signs for us to discharge them and give them some referrals to go somewhere else when they're ready is they're not growing. Mm-hmm. And and I'm not saying that they're, you know, we look at this, in, you know, in six months or even no. a year because it really depends on the person's situation. But it just over time, if you're not applying the things that we're teaching you in order to heal because that healing and you letting go of grudges and all of those things will allow you the opportunity and openness to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the pain feels better than the healing. Man, I don't even know what to say to that. I know (laughs) that was a truth bomb. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it really was. Yeah. And I, as a therapist, also as just a a woman, an individual, I just can't stand for that. You know, my, my friends and loved ones, they know, oh, oh, you out here acting a fool. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just not necessary. Why do you want to go through all of that? And I get everybody's on a different part of their journey, but I feel like I would be doing a disservice if I didn't hold people accountable that I loved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know what? I also think that the pain is something they become accustomed to as Mm -hmm. well. Like they friend. Yeah. It's it's, your little friend. There you go. I agree. Yeah. You don't know how to identify without it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes that goes to that fear of who will I be without this thing? Mm -hmm. Because it's been a part of me for so long that I don't almost couldn't even get it out. (laughs) Cause I'm, I hear it so often in session that I just don't know who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many people that have no idea about themselves as an individual. So like you both ladies have said, you know, you just identify with your struggle. Yeah. It's like, you know, interns, what would happen if you stopped being the victim of your own story? Hmm. You know, what would really happen? Do you think, is going to be more people that come and victimize you or are you going to get to like live the life that you really truly want to live? And I would add to that another question. When you begin your healing process, what are you going to fill that hole up with? Mm-hmm. That's one of the things I have to ask my addicts that I see a lot. Okay. So you're coming in here, you're seeing me, you probably have gone to rehab and now we've taken the one coping skill that you have used for 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 some and since they were 12 11 13 years old Mm -hmm. and now you like in your 40s and 50s that's a long time to use one coping skill so now what are you going to fill that up with you because the thing is we're telling you about this healing but you're going to have to fill it up with something Mm -hmm. something healthy preferably yes because you're releasing the pain and -hmm. healing from the pain. So don't fill it up with more pain. (laughs) Yeah. And use your resources. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, even if you have one person, you know, some people feel like they need to have this huge number of friends and, you know, this giant support system. And it's like, no, you need quality. So if you have one or two quality people in your support network, then you're good to go. I have to tell my adults this a lot. You have to remember you're not in high school anymore trying to be popular. You're a whole adult. Mm -hmm. Adults don't need that. Who are you going to try to be popular with? You're in the whole world. Nobody's going to know you're popular. And what does popularity do? In reality, cause more stress. Yes. Because you're trying to keep that status. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Mm -hmm. Nobody want to deal with all of that. I get, you know, some people are, you know, chasing after the fame and chasing after all that kind of stuff but at the end of the day why you want people to know your name you trying to trade songs it up in here (laughs) (laughs) no get somewhere and sat down yeah yeah i agree so some ways that we'll just give you and we've already kind of put it in there a little bit but we're going to give you some ways to become vulnerable um to make it a little bit easier So as we said earlier, ease into it. You know, most people who have a difficult time being vulnerable have experienced betrayal. So it's going to be difficult for you to begin to trust people and situations. And so usually the thing that I tell people who I begin to work um, with on trust is start off trusting you. 
because a lot of times you'll feel like, oh man, I, I trusted this person in my life and they hurt me. So I can't even trust my own decisions because my picker is off. I, I remember before I met my fiance, I used to say that a lot. My picker is off you did. with men. Mm-hmm. And I used to be like, no, it's not. They just sorry. <laughs> And so I had to learn how to trust my decisions when it came to mm-hmm. men in order for me to allow mm-hmm. my fiance to come in my life mm-hmm. or be in my life rather. Yeah. And then the reality is when you do trust yourself wholeheartedly and something happens, you can be like, hmm, let me, of course, be introspective and see what's going on with me. But oftentimes you find out that that person no longer needs to be in your life because they've done something that's unacceptable to you. And it's not about blaming yourself. It's it's back to that fault and responsibility. Yes, you own the responsibility of how you have interacted with this person, but they have to own or not. They have to own. You have to give the fault over to them because they are the one that hurt you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And so then another one is take the time to clarify your feelings suppressing difficult emotions for a long time can make you lose sight of how you actually feel. Yes. And we, we've talked about this in different sessions. Um, like the ladder of emotions, we have primary emotions and then we have secondary emotions. And we, we identify primary emotions as like sad, hurt, pain, things like that. And then it grows. If you, if you suppress it, it grows into like feeling you feeling overwhelmed. And that's kind of when your anxiety starts uh, to come in, Mm -hmm. you stuff and suppress that you start feeling uh, frustrated stuff and suppress that mad until you get to anger. And so now the emotion that you identify is anger instead of the, which is a secondary emotion instead of the primary emotion, which started with sadness or hurt. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then people can learn to be vulnerable by becoming comfortable with strong emotions Mm, yes (sighs) sit in it (laughs) yes i used to do that a lot yes i used to do that a lot when i worked at um a particular rehab (laughs) and i knew my because my clients i mean the 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 patients live there for a couple of weeks or so and I would have an intense session with my clients and I would just let them sit there. I wouldn't even bring them now in private practice. We have to bring them out cause we can't let them go. No. But because I knew that they were going to be at the facility with, you know, other people, other therapists. When I left, I was like, now sit in that. And I would, you're, you're, you're good. Mm-hmm. But doctor, mm-mm. Go. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. You've yeah. got to, I do that even, you know, in sessions now, I don't like just leave them, of course, like Dr. Jones was saying, because that's unethical. But we don't, we're not trying to have and, situations out there. Like and we're that. talking. Yes, that's private practice. It was not unethical for me to do it in rehab. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> they were in a safe place. Exactly. Yes. But in private practice, you know, I'll see a client doing say they getting mad or say they I can see them shutting down. I'll immediately stop the session and be like, OK, let's breathe. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you are feeling. Why did it make you feel that way? What are your thoughts that are attached to that? Breathe. Because at the end of the day, it is easier to get through the emotion if you tell yourself to breathe through it because Mm -hmm. it's just an emotion. Mm -hmm. It is literally just indicating that something is going on and I need to pay attention to it. Yeah. If you run from the intense emotion, you're giving it power over you instead of you powering it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And then you, you learn how to ask for what you need. It's easy to dismiss the pain, like Dr. Mm-hmm. Wall was just saying, but at, then her, hopefully her clients will then ask for what, they're, mm-hmm. what they need by expressing what it is that they're thinking based on the perception that they have about what she just said, what they yep. interpreted, and what it made them think about. Yeah, yeah. And we process all of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've literally had um, a client when this client first came to see me, um, she had her first session after the intake assessment and she came back and she was like I almost didn't come back I was like okay and (laughs) she was I was like why she's like because something you said it really offended me I said okay let's unpack that and she looked at me like oh I'm, I'm not offending you no I this is your session and if I did something to hurt you I need to know that so that I don't do that anymore but we ended up unpacking it And it wasn't even what she was thinking. She was just linking something from her, you know, experience growing up in her childhood home to what I had said. 
Mm-hmm. And then she's like, oh, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know? And so that person be like, is my appointment next week? <laughs> 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 she's like, I'm not going anywhere. But, you know, you have to really give yourself the opportunity to be vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it all boils down to. Mm-hmm. And then slow down and be present for yourself and others, but mm-hmm. start with you. Yes. Cause if you can be, learn how to be present for yourself, you can extend that externally to be present with, for other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that whole be present is not trying to project into the future, not throwing back to the past, what's going on in the here and now, what is it that's your feeling? Um, you know, what are you in the moment? So when we talk about being present. Yeah. I want to say another way to be vulnerable is also, you know, allowing yourself to admit that you didn't do something right and not, yeah, the imperfection, you know, we've talked about this quite a few times um, on the podcast, you know, there's an importance of being okay with not knowing or not um, being at the top of something because there's just no way to avoid that. There's no way you gonna know Mm -hmm. every single thing, or maybe you suck at something. Uh, yes thank yes. you <laughs> thank you for saying that <laughs> you know yeah it, it's like oh i got to be perfect at everything no mm-mm. that's not even possible and and i think i i said this uh before in the sibling one that i feel like my bro- anything that my brother puts his hand on he can do it mm-hmm. but the thing is he's still not perfect at everything and i know that but still i just feel like anything he put his mind to do mm-hmm. he can do it mm-hmm. yeah you know my thoughts about perfection. <laughs> it's like trying to catch smoke. <laughs> you can't do it. Mm-hmm. Just slip right through your fingers. Yep. Yes. It feel like I, I could see it and I could feel it, but it just oh, evaporates just when right, I try to touch just it. Just right through. Mm-hmm. Now this is another one that Dr. Strickland mentioned is you know taking responsibility instead of blaming others. That's a main one. Like mm-hmm. you got to own your stuff. Like it can't always be somebody else, you know, a common question in the dating world, you know, cause I'm in that, that era of my life, <laughs> um, is like, okay, why'd you break up with your last person? And if that person is always saying X, Y, and Z, like blaming the other person, that's a problem. Now that's not to say that if they say, Hey, that person wasn't ready, that's not blaming the person that's just saying what it is but if they're like okay he did this and she did that and they a piece of crap and they okay okay you need to heal Mm -hmm. (laughs) ma'am and you done went too far please and thank you (laughs) yeah Yeah. no i agree (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -mm -mm. yeah you know that vulnerability ain't no joke it's not no and it it takes practice it really does because You'll fi- find yourself being vulnerable one day and it's like, mm-mm, mm-mm, that's too scary. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a, a yo-yo. Uh-uh, let me bring you back. Let me bring you back. Mm-hmm. I, I let you go yeah. out there a little bit. Uh-uh, you couldn't handle it. Come on back. Yeah. <laughs> and it's okay it's to a take visual. a break too, though. Mm-hmm. Like I, I tell people all the time, okay, if you need to go take a break, go sit down somewhere. Now, don't be trying to be out in public taking your break and you know you still need to be practicing certain things. But I know for me personally, there's times where I'm like, I don't really like people right now, which I mean, that's often but that's not the point i'm an introvert (laughs) (laughs) but i have to go sit down and lay down because i've noticed times when i don't do that i start taking stuff out on people yeah Mm -hmm. and now because now i need a defense mechanism and i need to push people back when the reality is i need to go sit down so that i could be okay yeah yeah i'm an ambivert and i know (laughs) ambi and i know that when i start shutting down or start taking things out like dr wall was saying on other people i need to go somewhere and sit down Mm -hmm. i need to what what's going on with you Mm -hmm. i I have to have a conversation with myself when i was younger i used to see my dad sometimes talk to himself i remember (laughs) one time i asked him dad why do you talk to yourself he said when you get older you'll you'll understand and boy do i understand now because sometimes i have to have a conversation with myself i tell my clients all the time you need to hear it. Mm-hmm. You, having that echo chamber in your head, it just, 
it does not have the same effect. <laughs> yes. And you, you trying to challenge thoughts internally no, does not have the work. same effect. And you trying to make decisions based on those thoughts that's in yeah. your head. That's when people make poor decisions. Yes. You make a decision yes. based on se- decisions that's in your head. I tell people, my folks all the time, please write it out. <gasps> if you can't speak it to somebody, write it out. Or I'll hear them say in session, now that I say that to you, it do sound kind of crazy. Yes. I said, well, I didn't say it. You said it. But, <laughs> you know, you really, you got to think through what you mm-hmm. are, you know, saying to yourself. Because sometimes just because you think it, it don't make it true. And just because you feel it don't mean that it's connected the way you think it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Talk it out. Use your words. Mm-hmm. Not your behavior. And identify your emotions. Amen. That's honey. attached to that. Mm-hmm. So as is customary, we usually give you all a quote at the end. And our, this quote is by Brene Brown. As you, If you don't know her, this is her baby. Vulnerability is her baby. You either walk inside your story and you own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. Must be his body control. So, okay, interns, process your notes. Be sure to catch us next session and find us on all major platforms at The Recycled Podcast. If you're a new intern, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thanks for listening. And remember, we are shifting and reshaping our psyche through healing conversations and connections, one discussion at a time.